Hi, welcome back to another edition of Social Isolation Adventure Stories by Bjorn Olson. Um, I hope that everybody is doing good and keeping, you know, their positive mental energy at as maximum as it can be. I understand it's very difficult under the circumstances. Um, one of the ways that I feel like each of us can um, do our best with these times is to, you know, use whatever spare time we may have now um, to work on creative endeavors that, you know, we often are, find ourselves too busy um, to be able to uh, engage in. And I've seen that that seems to be a real trend. A lot of people are kind of, you know, learning crafts and learning skills and learning how to cook and learning how to work on art and take take this time to kind of improve ourselves in these ways that, you know, we often have to um, push to the back burner. So uh, in today's uh, social isolation adventure story, so far all the ones that I've read are... Um, cycling adventure stories but today i figured i would read a uh, a kayaking story so without further ado oh and i'm wearing my greenland i've actually worn it in a lot of these videos my greenland hoodie that my friend Malugiak, who is a greenlander gave me so it's it's fitting for this story and so this story i uh wrote in 2018 so there's some of the things have changed since then but i'm just going to read it as i wrote it then and the story is tr called traditional kayak i gently set my new skin on frame sea kayak into the draining tidal slough and then shoehorned into the tight cockpit as i readied myself the outgoing outgoing current tried to pull me loose from the shore I set my paddle to lock me in place while I secured the neoprene spray skirt and pulled on gloves. At the mouth of the slough and all along the shore, four to six foot waves crashed. The water was most dynamic where the current met the waves. I set my eyes on this zone, studied it for a minute, took a breath, and shoved off. How the new-to-me kayak would handle big waves was a mystery and one I was anxious to solve. On most days, one can look out from a perch above any Alaskan harbor and observe a variety of watercraft. By many people's estimation, a skiff is the most utilitarian boat for exploring the bays, sounds, and fjords of Alaska. A skiff, with its complementary outboard motor, is a fishing, hunting, and sightseeing vessel distinctly capable of coming ashore. The skiff, however, is a latecomer. For millennia, another vessel reigned supreme in Alaska and throughout the circumpolar north, the skin-on-frame sea kayak. Traditional kayaks are elegant watercraft made from raw local materials, driftwood, bone, animal sinew, and hide, and are the product of hundreds of generations of refinement and perfection. Each region throughout the Arctic has, a, has specific and exacting designs. Kayaks are hunting and fishing vessels, which, in the care of a skilled practitioner, are one of the most adept watercrafts the world has known. Kayaks are one of the few boats that can be capsized and re-righted. The swift current pulled me towards the roaring waves. I widened my knees, locking them into a secure position, and rapidly dipped the boat right and left a couple of times to acquaint myself with its stability. To properly sea kayak, hips must remain loose. A four-foot wave jacked up in front of me, grew to five feet, and crashed. I pulled hard on my paddle and leaned forward. My little dart of a kayak pierced the first wave handsomely. The next one in the set was bigger. As it stood up, stood up and took shape, I realized that this one was going to clobber me. Weighing my options, I needed to make a decision, and fast. The legacy of the kayak throughout the circumpolar north varies, but for the most part, skiffs and outboard motors began replacing their use in the early 20th century. One big exception, however, was in Greenland, where the art of kayak building and their practical use never fully went out of fashion. In the 1980s, many Greenlanders worried that the kayak was falling out of use. Kayana Katufinat, Inuit for Kayaks Club, was founded with the idea to develop traditional kayaking into a sport, which is now the country's most popular, followed by soccer. The organization's position is that the physical process of building kayaks and learning the skills of how they are used is communicative of cultural knowledge, which cannot be acquired any other way than practical and personal experience. 
In Greenland, children begin learning to kayak at age six. By their teenage years, they are allowed to compete in the summer kayak contests. These competitions consist of races, demonstration of dozens of capsize and recovery rolls, harpoon throwing, rope gymnastics, and other techniques. Every summer, thousands of years worth of knowledge, innovation, and traditions are celebrated and handed to the next generation. As a result, the flame of the kayak within Greenland was never quenched. Alaska, however, was not so fortunate. By the 1940s, with the increasing popularity of motorized watercrafts, one generation neglected to pass on the skills and methods of ocean paddling to the next. It is possible to infer how to replicate traditional kayak, Alaska kayaks. It's impossible to know what techniques their, their practitioners employed on the water, however. The most famous contemporary Greenlandic kayaker is 35-year-old Maligiak Padilla. Maligiak received his first kayak at a young age from his grandfather, a highly respected hunter. After a rigorous mentorship, Padilla became kayak, champion kayak man of the year for a record holding 10 times. He has now built over 450 traditional kayaks and has taught classes the world over. Maligiak, a torchbearer for the Circumpolar Inuit, is celebrated in Greenland and within kayaking circles like a rock star. Maligiak's kayaks hang in the Smithsonian Museum, public buildings, schools, and other institutions, but he's most gratified by the kayaks that slip through the water and are put to vigorous use. Currently a resident of Anchorage, Maligiak is on a mission to revitalize traditional kayaks and the skills of their use here in Alaska. Over the last several years, he has traveled throughout the state, studying and replicating regional designs, building kayaks with school-aged youth, and fostering interest in the renewal of recently lost traditional skills. Last winter, in a 60-foot yurt, heated by a wood stove and pleasant company, several people, including myself, built traditional kayaks under Maligiak's guidance in Homer, Alaska. Each kayak is made to fit the owner, relying on anthropometry, measurements and proportions of the human body. In nine days, the kayaks were shaped, lashed, skinned with ballistic nylon, nylon, and waterproofed. The wave in front of me advanced and grew frightfully tall. At the last possible second, I intentionally tipped over rather than taking the heavy wave on my head. My lower body remained firmly locked into the boat. Under Maligiak's expert care, I had made this craft to fit perfectly. The wave slammed onto my upturned hull, and the turbulence jostled me like an earthquake made for one. When the commotion subsided, I reached my paddle to the surface, made a wide sweep with the blade, and rolled back upright. On my face, an uncontainable grin, ready for the next one. Before the Roman civilization or the pyramids of Egypt, kayaks had been cutting the waters of Alaska. The simple and elegant technology, adroit and at home in the most punishing marine conditions, makes too much sense not to exist. The traditional kayak has re-emerged, unwilling to go extinct. Thank you for listening. I hope you're staying safe and stay tuned for the next episode.